welcome to SS Workshop. Today we're going to be having a look at the benchtop mill. In this series, we're going to take a look at some of the machines in the workshop, their features, and how I've modified them. Today we're looking at the mill, which is an Optimum MH28V. It has a large table being 730 by 210 millimeters, and a travel of 430 by 220 millimeters. It has a dovetail column providing up to 355 millimeters of travel. It has a one and a half horsepower motor, and it came with an MT3 taper spindle. Speed control for this mill is electronically variable. This provides great adjustability, being able to adjust the speed on the fly. According to the specs, it has a speed range of 100 to 2500 RPM. In reality, it struggles at the bottom end as it tends to speed up as the torque increases. Being electronically variable, it does struggle at the bottom end of the torque, but that's the downside to having infinite adjustability. There's a mechanical gear which changes the RPM from about 1000 RPM up to 2500, but I find I don't use the top end very much. Unfortunately, this gear seems to be the failure point in the driveline, and I've had to replace this about three times already. If you want to know more about this, check out the link above to my video about replacing this gear. This mill comes with a plastic chuck guard for safety cutoff. I gave it a hard life, so I've ended up upgrading it with clear acrylic and a steel flat bar. This is also height adjustable, which is quite handy when I'm using the big face mill. It can really help to contain the chips. This also came with a rubber chip guard for the ways, which I've ended up replacing after a couple of years because I gave it a hard life. Next up, let's have a look at the vise. I'm currently using this 160mm angle lock type vise. I started out with a Vertex K-Type 125mm vise, but upgraded because I wanted the coolant channels that come with this type of vise. But I must say, the increased size increases the capability of the mill. One thing to note here is your table does have a maximum capacity, so using a large vise can seriously reduce this. I've also removed the rotating base for this vise, as it makes the setup much more rigid. It also increases the height clearance, and is easily reinstalled if required. Next up, let's have a look at the vertical height adjustment. This is controlled with a hand wheel on the top of the column, and a couple of lock handles for securing it. The dovetail column seems to give really good rigidity, and there seems to be reasonable height clearance for most jobs. One thing to note is your tooling can really impact on the height clearance. So even though there's 355 mils of head travel, a good chunk of that can get eaten up by the tooling. While we're talking about the column, it's also worth mentioning it came standard with the Constantina chip guard. Next up, let's have a look at the power drawbar I've added. This allows the tooling to be changed without the use of a couple of spanners. I find this is huge for speeding up my workflow, but if you're starting out, this is a serious luxury item. I built this out of a butterfly pneumatic wrench and some scrap steel I had around the workshop. Basically, there's a couple of springs which compress, a square sump plug socket, which fits the butterfly wrench and the 10mm square end of the drawbar. You pull down on the handle I've added to the butterfly trigger, then pull left and right to loosen and tighten the drawbar. This is the simplest way I could find to build a power drawbar, and was really cost effective. Next up, let's have a quick look at the drawbar. Actually, I've got more than one. What's important here is MT3 tooling comes with various threads. M12 by 1.75, which is standard in New Zealand and Australia, M12 by 1.5, which is what Chinese tooling comes with, and I've also seen Whitworth tooling out of the UK. So I've ended up making myself an extra drawbar to accept the Chinese tooling. This was pretty easy to turn on the lathe, and expands my tooling options. While we're here, it's probably also worth noting that these bolts in the bottom of the head casting allow the head to be rotated for angled cuts. In most situations, I'd recommend rotating the part rather than the head, and these bolts really need to be tight as I've had the head rotate under heavy cutting. The mill also came standard with a light in the bottom of the casting, and I've added this additional LED light. This coil height readout also came standard, but I've superseded it with a 3 axis digital readout. This is a clone of a professional unit and uses glass scales and provides a number of functions. These include bolt hole circle, a PCD, angled and ellipse hole functions, and angled and curved cut functions to name a few. As with my lathe, using a digital readout has significantly increased the accuracy of my work. 
removing the need to count the hand wheel turns and allow for backlash in measurements. Now let's have a look at how the scales are fitted. Firstly starting with the Z axis. I've chosen to have the Z axis on the quill as this is where small incremental moves are made. So I've located the scale on the front of the head. This is it with the dust cover removed. I've made a mounting plate which mounts through the standard screw holes in the front of the head. The scale is then fixed to this. The ready head is mounted on an arm which is fixed to the quill with its standard mounting screws. So this is all completely reversible. Moving on to the Y axis, I have drilled and fixed the scale to the body and have used a couple of adjustable plates to mount the reader. I have also added a cover to prevent coolant damage. The X axis is actually a little simpler. The scale is mounted to the back of the table and the reader to the carriage. Next up, coolant. I've fitted a coolant system to this mill. It came as a generic kit for any machine with the electrical pre-wired to an on-off switch and a tank with an internal baffle and pump. I've added a bull valve to reduce the flow and I find I have this running as low as possible otherwise I'll inundate the coolant channels which drain the T-slots in the table. The table drain returns back to the tank to be recirculated in the system. I've also had a crack at building a power feed using the motor and clutch from a cordless power drill. I found the most useful feature on it was the rapid traverse but it's not quite fast enough and I can actually wind the handle faster myself so it really never gets any use. Now let's have a quick look at the walls around the mill. Starting with my trusty speed chart, I use this all the time for setting the speeds on my mill. I keep a couple of plastic and copper hammers, along with all the standard spanners I use on the mill. This is really handy and it ensures that the correct spanners are used. I keep my rotary table and angle plate tucked behind the mill. This minimises lifting. I also keep a couple of sets of hold down bolts on the wall. On the other side I keep the MT3 tooling that I often use, along with my collection of cutting oil. While we're here let's have a closer look at the tooling. Starting with the keyless drill chuck. 50mm carbide insert base mills. I have two of these, one with a square shoulder and the other with the cutters at 45 degrees. The 45 degree type is meant to reduce the torque and I've had a lot of success with this. It also seems to put less vibration on the machine, so that could be down to the insert type. Next up is a fly cutter. This is really an alternative to a face mill, but it also has its own place, being adjustable in diameter. This is a recent acquisition, so you should be seeing more of this in future videos. Now on to end mill holders, this is a direct MT3 collet and this is an ER32 collet chuck. The nice thing with an MT3 collet is the reduced stick out, but this is why I also use the ER32 collet chuck as it provides greater visibility. End mills could be a video all by itself, but I mostly use high speed steel cutters which I buy online from China, as generally they'll get broken sooner or later and it hurts a lot less if they're cheap to start out with. Hopefully this has given you an insight into the mill and tooling I use. If you're new to the channel, and keen to see this mill in action, check out my series, The Fell Engine Project, where I'm building a 3.5 inch gauge live steam locomotive. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. Catch you next time!